You're watching City Channel 4, your window to our community. to do this a little bit differently today for the introduction of our speaker. I would like Asata's help in co-introducing our speaker for the day. Um, for the occasion of Kartha's 10th anniversary, I had arranged for a dear friend of mine and Kartha board member, Linda Herr, to fly in from Boston. I was first introduced to Linda through Paula Epsel, head of the Nova Science Series, whom I ran into by sheer chance at the TED conference in Monterey, California in February 2006. Then I met Linda Herr in Washington, D.C. in June 2006, on the day that she and her team were receiving the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation's Global Health Media Excellence Award. So Linda has been affiliated with Karta even before I founded the organization, and she has spoken for me at several of the international symposia that I've organized. Linda has been a most precious intellectual as well as moral supporter for my work, which I'm very, very thankful for. Linda and her husband, George, are the nicest people and write the world's best holiday greeting and updates. Both of them are writers. George is a published author whose most recent novel is Reunion at Red Paint Bay. To have Linda in Iowa City is a dream come true for me. Our brand new Rotarian, Asada Caldwell, has a few words now to share with you about Linda, and then we'll start the program. <laughs> had, to get, had to get my notes. Okay. <laughs> so, on this day, I begin my life, life's work as a Carthan and a Rotarian. Because of my education and professional aspirations as a scientific illustrator, I am being accepted and being asked to advance humanitarian projects, both global and local. I am the Carthen Glocal. But I look for suitable role models who have operated this way, so I find this moment to be very exciting and humbling. I am very honored to have this chance to introduce my fellow Carthen, Linda Hare. As a growing visual communicator, I look upon Linda's vast accomplishments in complete awe. If I went through her entire bio sketch, we would never get done before 1 p.m. Linda is an independent executive producer at WGBH Boston, as well as a director and writer focusing on science, technology, global health, and the environment. I, like you, am excited to hear Linda speak. So with great pleasure, I introduce to you Linda Hare. <laughs> It's my first trip to Iowa City, and I'm thrilled to be here. It's an adventure to come to a new place, but a new place that values a sense of service and a sense of literature, especially close to my heart. So thank you so much. And as I was telling Usha, I am somewhat coming full circle here because when I was in high school, I was a student council president, and our high school, very small, 63 graduating class, decided to take on a program of building a school in Ethiopia. And we tried to raise a thousand dollars to build that school. And my job was to go to some of the local service clubs, and especially Rotary, uh, to give a talk about why we wanted to build this school. So I feel as if I'm kind of coming full circle here. And uh, I'm reminded as I look at wonderful Asita and her work, I've seen her little video on on encouraging young children to keep at it with the braces on their legs to help to correct the clubfoot um, condition. Um, that we sometimes think about young people as being future leaders of America, America, but in fact they're current leaders. And I'm humbled by the work that you've already done at a young age and the power of passion of your commitment to, to uh, experience. And I want to thank Usha for inviting me. Usha has been kind of a bright light in my life. 
Uh, I think you all are very lucky to have her here on a regular basis. She's one of the most vivacious and curious and generous and outgoing people that I know. And I think you see the happiness that comes through her life through be being engaged, which all of you are as well in, in many other ways and other capacities. So I'm proud to be a um, CARTHA board member, and I didn't even know what a technology manager was until I met Usha. <laughs> she invited me to a conference of them. <laughs> so that was very interesting to hear about the different uh, skills that one must have in order to get a good idea in global health out into the marketplace um, to have it tested and, and the kinds of um, ways. And I've tried in some ways to help advise on how you tell stories about whatever it is you're trying to do in your life. So anyway, I'm pri privileged to be here. Um, I've been lucky to have a, a career with the NOVA Science Series. I've made about 20 documentaries and at one time was perhaps NOVA's most traveled um, producer. I've been in 35 countries around the world and all seven continents, including Antarctica, where I made a film in the um, Antarctic ozone hole back in 1987. And, um, I have always liked the place where technology comes together, science and technology, to try to address human problems. And uh, I've worked on programs from <laughs> nuclear fusion to animal communication to um, a portrait of Stephen Jay Gould to, to uh, a series called Race to Save the Planet. So it's been a very varied life and I've been lucky to have some of the world's leading scientists it explained to me how they do what they do. And uh, I've tried to translate that uh, work into something that will be useful and understandable by, by a lay audience. So we work very hard on those programs. And uh, one that gave me the greatest sense of mission was uh, called Rx for Survival, the Global Health Challenge. And Usha mentioned this. Um, we laugh about it because we say, only on public television would you have Brad Pitt, his voice, but not his face. <laughs> <laughs> so we were fortunate to get Brad Pitt to be our narrator, and we thought that it really helped to get more people into the room, sort of into the tent, as they say. <laughs> and sometimes we work with celebrities who are willing to help us out that way, and Brad was very patient because it takes a long time to record the narrations for six hours of, of programming. Um, and in fact, my own son <laughs> said he was able to get a date with a girl he really liked because we could go home and watch this film that his mom had had something to do with <laughs> and uh, and um, Brad Pitt was going to be the narrator. <laughs> so anyway, I'd like to show you a few clips from, um, from uh, Rx for Survival and then we'll talk a little bit more about storytelling and um, some of the work that Rotary's been doing too. Here we go. Despite the advances of medical science, our world is still haunted by the specter of dangerous disease. There are now 30 some new diseases that we had never seen before. Not something that had been going on forever. This is new. Microbes know no boundaries. And there is no risk so remote that it can't affect us here. Even ancient killers are staging a lethal comeback. The fact is, there are more people now infected with tuberculosis than at any other time in human history. Have all their brothers and sisters taken? Tell them. Rx for Survival is the story of the greatest challenges in global health today and of the men and women who are meeting them head on. This is a war. This is the ammunition for the war. A last ditch effort to eliminate polio from the face of the planet hangs in the balance. If we leave a single child out, we jeopardize the entire world. Really, it's that serious. Strong antibiotics need to reach TB victims in Peru. But these drugs are harsh and difficult to take. We had to go and convince them, please, you need to continue taking your medicines, because if you don't, you're going to die. And the stakes are even higher for Ernest Darko and a landmark program to save the people of Africa afflicted with HIV AIDS. It scares me, frankly, to think about what will happen if we don't get this to work. 
I think we'll lose arguably half the continent of Africa. But solutions, even to our most pressing problems, are being found every day all over the world. An eye doctor from Baltimore discovered that two drops of vitamin A can mean the difference between life and death for millions of children. And a remarkable group of women is leading Bangladesh out of the depths of poverty and illness. Wherever there is creativity, leadership, and commitment, the landscape of global health is changing. Coming next, Rx for Survival, The Heroes. Okay, we'll stop it there. Thank you. Well, at any rate, we um, made this six-hour series and we were honored to have the Emmy for the best documentary series. Very exciting for us uh, who had worked so hard and it was a large team of people who worked on that, that series. Things have gotten better certainly on the HIV AIDS front um, since that reporting was done, but now we have new challenges with Zika and chikungunya and um, Ebola, of course, was a huge challenge. We hope that some of the public health lessons um, have been learned. But I especially wanted to mention um, that um, the work that the Rotary Foundation has done, or Rotary International has done with polio, has been so appreciated by the public health community. And yesterday, Usha was telling me about Dr. Carlos Conseco, who had really <coughs> helped to bring Rotary to the table, and I don't think we would be where we are with this wonderful progress that has been made um, over the years without Rotary's leadership. So what uh, Usha calls globalizing the local and the and the global is has been so important, and I commend you all for having stuck with it because these are not easy problems to solve, and. Um, we were funded for this series by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and um, by the Merck Company Foundation. Um, and Bill Gates at the time, I remember, was watching 24 on television. <laughs> and he said, tell better stories. Good stories is what we need to get people more involved in public health and, and communication. And one of my heroes, who some of you may have run across, Dr. William Fagey, who was head of the CDC once upon a time, and then he was with the Gates Foundation. He teaches at Emory University, and now he lives in Washington. He may be close to retirement, but he's such a wonderful guy and has done so much to help the world in, in, uh, in both smallpox and polio. And he was very involved with the smallpox effort uh, back in Nigeria and in India, and where they pioneered this idea of ring vaccination, finding out who, who is it who has the disease, going and vaccinating all the people within a certain distance around that patient. And in India, in the sequence we had in Rx for Survival, we showed how they employ young children, you know, who know what's going on in the community to, to come and, and tell who's sick, who's hidden away, and so on. But Bill Fagey told a wonderful story. He was uh, working in India, and he had had a long talk with a village chief, and he said, you know, we really need to vaccinate people because you have a patient here in, in your community. And um, he said, is it possible to call in your people and have them be vaccinated. And the chief said, well, they were just here this morning for a different meeting, you know, and they've all gone back to their homes. And Fagy looked disappointed, Dr. Fagy looked disappointed, and he said, oh, I'm, that's, you know, really too bad because we want to do the vaccination. He said, no problem, the chief said. He said, I'll put the message out on the talking drum. So he had his drummers 
beat out the message uh, to come into the center of the uh, village to receive the vaccinations. And um, after they had finished, Dr. Fagy said, just curious, what did you say to the villagers? And the chief said, come and see the tallest white man in the world. <laughs> Bill Fahey's about six foot seven, I think. <laughs> he may look like the tallest white man in the world. <laughs> He's also just a wonderful, wonderful storyteller, and he uses humor. I've learned so much from him and been inspired by him. But uh, part of what he said was, meet the audience where they are, you know, and we tried to figure out how, what do our, does our audience know about global health as we were thinking about um, creating the series and we joke among ourselves that sometimes making television is like creating telegrams for tiny tots <laughs> and you, we imagine someone sitting at home with their hand on the remote you know grazing around figuring out what to watch with sometimes the attention span of a sparrow <laughs> and so if we don't catch them in the first couple of minutes we all think, oh my gosh, there's going to be a thunder of clicks as everybody <laughs> goes to the next message. So we ran some focus groups around the country to try to figure out what do people really know about global health. And a lot of people thought public health was something that was poor people going to the emergency room and the reason why their child couldn't get their broken leg seen to because poor people were sick um, and were ahead of them. Um, they also thought that um, the worst problems of the day, they knew about HIV AIDS, but they thought that the worst problems of the day, malaria, they, they thought malaria and tuberculosis had pretty much been taken care of. They had no idea how rampant those two diseases were in, in the larger world. And um, they especially thought flesh-eating fasciitis, which had been in the news just recently, and anthrax and threats of smallpox, smallpox were the major health challenges, because these had been in the headlines. And while well, smallpox was eradicated, flesh-eating fasciitis doesn't happen that often, certainly in the US. I, I'm not sure how widespread it is anywhere else. Um, and you know the, the idea that malaria was almost gone was, you know, really an error. So um, we realized we had a big, a big mission to do <laughs> to try to correct some of these misapprehend misapprehensions. So the art of storytelling is really, I think, to put the human face on the story to create something that engages both the mind and the heart. Because only if the heart is engaged will people really remember what the mind has learned. And sometimes we use these big numbers um, in our documentaries, which can be overwhelming. Joseph Stalin, who was a ma an expert on mass murder, once said, a single death is a tragedy. A million deaths is a statistic. And he was right. And we throw out these big numbers sometimes, and they're, they just cause people's eyes to glaze over. There's even research that shows a few put three children on a screen, people are less interested than if you put one, one child's face on the screen. So it's a matter of, of telling stories. Years ago, I was producing a film on child survival, filming in what are, were called the diarrhea capitals of the world, where dehydration was taking so many lives every single day, dehydration usually due to, to um, unclean water. And about the same time, some of you may remember that a little girl named Jessica fell down a well in Texas. And the eyes of the world were on this situation. Um, for several days, no one could get her out. And virtually anyone who knew the story would surely have reached into their wallet and pulled out $20 if they knew it would help to save her life. But meanwhile, I was very frustrated because the untold stories of what then were 30,000 preventable deaths of children happening every single day weren't getting told. So these big numbers, people don't get them. They don't, people don't understand sometimes the difference between a million and a billion. One way to get around this can be through metaphors. And in Fenway Park in Boston, where our Red Sox play, you could show the stadium filled of 
with, with people, and that's 30,000 uh, on a day when they're so sold out. Um, but the other important thing is to show where the hope lies, because otherwise your audience will just become numb and turn away. And um, that's something that we try very hard to put into all of our stories. One of the people you saw in the clip was um, Dr. Jim Kim, who came from Muscatine, Iowa. And he told the story of the multi-drug resistant um, tuberculosis that the gentleman was, speak was suffering from in Peru. And uh, as a result of some of that story becoming wider known, um, a, a treatment that would be inhalable by people who have tuberculosis was developed in aerosol kind of treatment so that they wouldn't have to, they're very thin people, very skeletal, having to get injections every single day was terribly painful. So um, that has helped to move things in a better direction. And Dr. Kim um, is now president of the World Bank. I don't know if you know that, but um, right, Iowa born. <laughs> And um, he said about caring about global health is part of the citizenship test for living on the planet. Global health is fun. It's fascinating and exhilarating. It's like going to the moon. It will break your heart and fracture your soul enough to make you a better person. You can make a difference and save a huge number of lives. So Dr. Fagy, I think, uh, again, my hero from Rotary and from the Gates Foundation and Emory, He's, he talks about how so many people are chasing happiness or success. And he, he says he thinks that people mistake happiness, you know, in acquiring things as being the be all and end all for, for what, they're, what they're after. But he thinks that really what we're after is satisfaction. So it's a positive emotion that comes because of things that you can make happen. So. That's what I commend in what I've seen in the service of people in Rotary, and I thank you again for the invitation to be here. Linda would be happy to take some questions. Oh, yes, yeah. I'm sorry. I forgot. <laughs> Does anyone have a question they wanted to? So I have planted a couple of questions <laughs> for the fear that nobody would ask. So if you need to ask, please ask right now. Um, Roger? How did you get motivated to do these documentaries? Hmm. Can you repeat the question? Please? Yes. Um, the question was, how did I get motivated to do these documentaries? And uh, well, I think, as I mentioned, the high school experience of trying to be involved in telling stories of, of uh, what's happening abroad um, has always been of interest to me, um, but I then later started to do more domestically as well. And it was the early days of the NOVA Science Series, and I was intrigued by the idea of showing what can be done when, when science and medicine and technology come together um, to help solve human problems. So. Yes. How long did it take to run implement ten? Sure. It was about two years to produce Could the you whole. Me the question? Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, it. She asked, "How long does it take from the beginning to the end?" I would say it took about two years to make the documentary series. They filmed in, I think, 20, 20 different countries altogether, and um, we had. Um, but six teams working, six individual producers. And it takes about um, six to nine months to actually film a whole one hour documentary for a NOVA kind of um, experience. I don't know if you know, NOVA's been on the air for 44 years, which is longer than Friends. <laughs> Even I Love Lucy. <laughs> uh, so we're excited that it's still here and seems to be still very live and, and vibrant. But um, making that series took two years. And we did a major effort on child survival in concert with it. We held a giant conference in New York where the three Bills came, Bill, Bill Clinton, Bill Gates, and who's my third? Bill Figge, of course. And they had a great conversation about global health. And um, 
we brought in frontline providers of global health. We did a uh, um, whole Time Magazine issue that was devoted to global health. And I think we really helped to change, particularly some young people's ideas about what they wanted to do going into public health, uh, domestically or abroad, uh, as a result of that. Yeah. There's one. Oh. What is the picture? Oh. That picture, that's part of the animation for the title. It's a spinning globe that um, shows you, we use that as a device to kind of create what we call the seriousness of the series, which helps to draw it together. So we had different producers working and you want the audience to feel there's something that ties things together. So the spinning globe helped to show you where's the next story. So that's about to spin to the first story. <laughs> yes? Oh, sorry. Who funds all this? Who funds, Who funds all this? Yeah. yeah. Well, expensive. you help with some of it through your taxpayer dollars. We get a, a partial grant from the PBS um, system. Um, Congress gives some money to PBS. Um, NOVA has a number of corporate funders and foundation funders, depending upon the topic. Um, so. Yes, it's a, this one was by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Paul Allen um, in Seattle, who was Bill Gates' former partner, and um, also the Merck Company Foundation put money into this. So um, we're grateful to them. And you know, I, I have a friend who was just doing a series about business leaders, and, and um, I, remember, I was remembering that years ago, I went to Ted Turner, because we were trying to find money to do a series. And he said, you mean you guys have to go out and beg for the money <laughs> to do your programming? Because he was just starting the Superstation back then. And we were laughing uh, about that. But um, I, my, my friend was saying, you know, it's the business leaders who make things happen you know, in the world. They make jobs. And people like me who have lived in the nonprofit world, we stand on the shoulders of people like you who are out there making things happen. So um, we're grateful for that. Could you speak to the work that Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is doing on uh, malaria? Uh, <coughs> prevention? Yes, they've put a lot of effort into malaria prevention. And I know they're working on possible um, alteration of mosquitoes so that they will not be able to reproduce to, to uh, spread malaria. And they have a lot of hope that they can get the, the um, malaria very much tamped down um, in the near future. Years and years ago, there was a big effort in Brazil um, to use DDT to spray um, against malaria. And it came very, very close to knocking it out, but um, then concerns, the environmental concerns came up about, you know, what was the, going to be the impact of DDT on the ecosystem. So um, it kind of came roaring back, and um, we hope that there is some new progress on, on uh, bringing it down. And certainly those malarial bed nets have been extremely um, helpful in their bed nets have been distributed, well, they've been, be, they're beginning to be manufactured in, in Africa and um, distributed all over. So if children can be protected by bed nets, um, mosquitoes, mosquitoes tend to bite either um, in, in the evening um, or the late day or the early morning. So thank you. Linda, I have one last question for you. Yes. Um, my whole passion is about thinking on ideas and how they are gestated how they are birthed, how they are nurtured. So can you go back and give one example of how an idea even was born, which became a documentary? Hmm. OK. Well, my most recent production um, was uh, a, a program called Wild Ways. And I work with a colleague in Colorado. Um, this is about protected corridors for wildlife that need to m migrate for one reason or another, or either for purposes of healthy breeding across populations of, of creatures, or um, also for seasonal food, um, particularly in a time when <coughs> climate is changing and it's getting harder in some areas 
either for drought or extreme flooding reasons to find the proper food. So this, there's an idea in Yellowstone to Yukon, uh, which helps to tie Yellowstone Park to various national parks all the way up into the Yukon. And that's helping a lot to keep um, animals going in a crowded century. And it's building overpasses over highways. And somehow, they, they carpet them with um, trees and um, shrubbery. And the animals seem to find the way over the um, highway or under. And it helps to stop traffic accidents, too, which can be uh, certainly lethal to human beings as well as animals. Super. Thank you so much for coming, Thank Linda. You. So um, could you all rise and recite the four-way test? In everything we think, say, or do, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Our Rotary meeting is now adjourned.